determination of probable cause and issuance of warrant of arrest. 2. An information for murder was filed against Rapido, the RTC judge, after personally evaluating the prosecutor's resolution, documents and parties, affidavits, submitted by the prosecutor, found probable cause and issued a warrant of arrest. Rapido's lawyer examined the rollio of the case and found that it only contained the copy of the information. The submissions of the prosecutor and the copy of the warrant of arrest. Immediately, Rapido's counsel filed a motion to quash the arrest warrant for being void, citing as grounds 1. The judge before issuing the warrant did not personally conduct a searching examination of the prosecution witnesses in violation of his client's constitutionally mandated rights. Number 2. There was no prior order finding probable cause before the judge issued the arrest warrant. May the warrant of arrest be quashed on the grounds cited by Rapido's counsel? State your reason for each ground. 2015. No, the warrant of arrest may not be quashed based on the grounds cited by Rapido's counsel. In the issuance of warrant of arrest, the mandate of the Constitution is for the judge to personally determine the existence of probable cause. The words personal determination was interpreted by the Supreme Court in Sullivan v. McCaskill, November 14, 1988, as the exclusive and personal responsibility of the issuing judge to satisfy himself as to the existence of probable cause. What the law requires as personal determination on the part of a judge is that he should not rely solely on the report of the investigating prosecutor. Thus, Personal examination of the complainant and his witnesses is thus not mandatory and indispensable in the determination of probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest. People v. Joseph Jojo Gray July 26, 2010 At any rate, there is no law or rule that requires the judge to issue a prior order finding probable cause before the issuance of a warrant of arrest. Bail Q. After Alma had started serving his sentence for violation of Batas Pambansa, Bilang 22 or BP 22, she filed a petition for writ of habeas corpus, citing Vaca v. C.A., where the sentence of imprisonment of a party found guilty of violation of BP 22 was reduced to a fine equal to double the amount of the check involved. She prayed that her sentence be similarly modified and that she be immediately released from detention. In the alternative, she prayed that pending determination whether the VACA ruling applies to her, she be allowed to post bail pursuant to Rule 102, Section 14, which provides that if a person is lawfully imprisoned or restrained on a charge of having committed an offense not punishable by death, he may be admitted to bail in the discretion of the court. Accordingly, the trial court allowed Alma to post bail and then ordered her release. In your opinion, is the order of the trial court correct? A. Under Rule 102? No. Section 4, Rule 102 of the Rules of Court, Habeas Corpus, does not authorize a court to discharge by writ of habeas corpus a person charged with or convicted of an offense in the Philippines or of a person suffering imprisonment under lawful judgment. B. Under the Rules of Criminal Procedure, 2008. No. The trial court's order releasing Alma on bail, even after judgment against her has become final and in fact, she has started serving sentence, is a brazen disregard of the mandate and Section 24, Revised Rules of Criminal Procedure, that, in no case, shall bail be allowed after the accused has commenced to serve sentence. People v. Fitzgerald, October 27, 2006. When is bail a matter of right and when it is a matter of discretion? 1999, 2006. Bail is a matter of right. A. Before or after conviction by the Metropolitan Trial Court, Municipal Trial Court, Municipal Trial Court in cities, or Municipal Circuit Trial Court. B. Before conviction by the Regional Trial Court of an offense not punishable by death, reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment, Section 4, Rule 114. And C, if the charge involves a capital offense and the evidence of guilt is not strong. Section 7, Rule 114. 
Bail is a matter of discretion upon conviction by the regional trial court of an offense not punishable by death, reclusion, perpetua, or life imprisonment. Section 5, Rule 114. Q. When the accused is entitled as a matter of right to bail, may the court refuse to grant him bail on the ground that there exists a high degree of probability that he will abscond or escape. Explain. 1999. If bail is a matter of right, it cannot be denied on the ground that there exists a high degree of probability that the accused will abscond or escape. What the court can do is to increase the amount of the bail. One of the guidelines that the judge may use in fixing a reasonable amount of bail is the probability of the accused appearing in trial. Section 9, letter G, Rule 114, as amended by Circular Number 12-94, Q. At the public attorney's office stationed in Taguig, where you are assigned, your work requires you to act as public defender at the local regional trial court and to handle cases involving indigents. In one other case, an indigent mother seeks assistance for a 14-year-old son who has been arrested and detained for malicious mischief. Would an application for bail be the appropriate remedy or is there another remedy available? Justify your chosen remedy and outline the appropriate steps to take. 2013. Yes, an application for bail is an appropriate remedy to secure provisional remedy of the 14 year old boy. Under the rules, bail is a matter of right before or even after conviction before the MTC, which has jurisdiction over the crime of malicious mischief. Section 4, Rule 114. Consequently, Bail can be posted as a matter of right. Q. A was charged with murder in the lower court. His petition for bail was denied after a summary hearing on the ground that the prosecution had established a strong evidence of guilt. The motion for reconsideration was filed from the denial of the petition for bail. During the reception of the evidence of the accused, the accused reiterated his petition for bail on the ground that the witnesses so far presented by the accused had shown that no qualifying aggravating circumstance attended the killing. The court denied the petition on the grounds that it had already ruled that 1. The evidence of guilt is strong. 2. The resolution of the petition for bail is solely based on the evidence presented by the prosecution. and 3. No motion for reconsideration was filed from the denial of the petition for bail. If you are the judge, how will you resolve the incident? If I were the judge, I would grant the second petition for bail. Under Section 7, Rule 114, Rules of Court, no person charged with a capital offense or an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment shall be admitted to bail when evidence of guilt is strong, regardless of the stage of the criminal prosecution. In this case, the evidence of guilt for the crime of murder is not strong, as shown by the prosecution's failure to prove the circumstance that will qualify the crime to, and consequently convict the accused of, murder. Accordingly, the accused should be allowed to post bail because the evidence of his guilt is not strong. Section 13, Article 3, 1987, Constitution. Besides, it is settled that an order granting bail is merely interlocutory, which cannot attain finality. Pobre versus Pipo. B. Suppose the accused is convicted of the crime of homicide and the accused filed a notice of appeal. Is he entitled to bail? 2014. Yes. The accused is entitled to bail, subject to the discretion of the court. Under Section 5, Rule 114, Rules of Court, the appellate court may allow him to post bail because the trial court, in convicting him, changed the nature of the offense from non-bailable to bailable. Be that as it may, the denial of bail pending appeal is a matter of wise discretion since after conviction by the trial court, the presumption of innocence terminates and accordingly the constitutional rights to bail ends. Jose Antonio Leviste versus Court of Appeals, March 17, 2010. Hearing Application for Bail in Capital Offenses, Q. D was charged with murder a capital offense. After arraignment, he applied for bail. The trial court ordered the prosecution to present its evidence in full on the ground that only on the basis of such presentation could it determine whether the evidence of this guilt 
was strong for purposes of bail. Is the ruling correct? 2002. No. The prosecution is only required to present as much evidence as is necessary to determine whether the evidence of this guilt is strong for purposes of bail. Section 8. Rule 114. Q. In an information charging them of murder, policemen A, B, and C were convicted of homicide. A appealed from the decision, but was denied. Finally, the Court of Appeals rendered a decision acquitting A on the ground that the evidence pointed to the NPA as the killers of the victim. Was the Court of Appeals denial of A's application for bail proper? Yes. The Court of Appeals properly denied A's application for bail. The court had the discretion to do so, although A was convicted of homicide only since he was charged with a capital offense, on appeal he could be convicted of the capital offense. Obosa v. Court of Appeals, January 16, 1997. B. Can B and C be benefited by the decision of the Court of Appeals? 1998. B who did not appeal can be benefited by the decision of the Court of Appeals which is favorable and applicable to him, Section 11, Letter A, Rule 122. The benefit will also apply to C, even if his appeal is dismissed because of his escape. Q. If an information was filed in the RTC Manila charging D with homicide and he was arrested in Quezon City, in what court or courts may he apply for bail? 2002. D may apply for bail in the RTC Manila where the information was filed or in the RTC Quezon City, where he was arrested, or if no judge thereof is available with any metropolitan trial judge, municipal trial judge, or municipal circuit trial judge therein. Section 17, Rule 114. Q. In what forms may bail be given? 1999. Bail may be given by corporate surety or through a property bond, cash deposit, or recognizance. Section 1, Rule 114. Q. RP and the state XX have a subsisting extradition treaty. Pursuant thereto, RP's Secretary of Justice, SOJ, filed a petition for extradition before the MMRTC, alleging that Juan Juan is the subject of an arrest warrant duly issued by the proper criminal court of state XX in connection with a criminal case for tax evasion and fraud before his return to RP as a Balikbayan. Petitioner prays that one be extradited and delivered to the proper authorities of state XX for trial, and that to prevent one's flight in the interim, a warrant for his immediate arrest be issued. Before the RTC could act on the petition for extradition, one filed before it an urgent motion, in sum, praying one that SOJ's application for an arrest warrant be set for hearing, and two, that one be allowed to post bail in the event the court would issue an arrest warrant. Should the court grant or deny Juan's prayer, reason 2004. In this case, the court reviewed what was held in Government of United States of America versus Honorable Guillermo Porganan, presiding judge, RTC of Manila, Branch 42, and Mark B. Jimenez, Aka Mario Batacan, Crespo, April 2007, that the constitutional provision on bail does not apply to extradition proceedings, the same being available only in criminal proceedings. The court took cognizance of the following trends in international law. 1. The growing importance of the individual person in public international. Number 2. The higher value now being given to human rights. Number three, the re corresponding duty of countries to observe these universal human rights in fulfilling their treaty obligations. And four, the duty of this court to balance the right of the individual under our fundamental law on one hand and the law on extradition on the other. In light of the recent developments in international law, where emphasis is given to the worth of the individual and the sanctity of human rights, the court departed from the ruling in Purganan and held that an extradite may be allowed to post bail. Government of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region versus Honorable Olalia, April 19, 2007. Q. 
May the court require a witness to post bail? Explain your answer, 1999. Yes, the court may require a witness to post bail if he is a material witness and bail is needed to secure his appearance. The rules provide that when the court is satisfied upon proof or oath that a material witness will not testify when required, it may upon motion of either party order the witness to post bail in such sum as may be deemed proper. Upon refusal to post bail, the court shall commit him to prison until he complies or is legally discharged after his testimony is taken. Section 6, Rule 119. Q. A was charged with a non-bailable offense. At the time when the warrant of arrest was issued, he was confined in the hospital and could not obtain a valid clearance to leave the hospital. He filed a petition for bail, saying therein that he be considered as having placed himself under the jurisdiction of the court. May the court entertain his petition? 2012. Yes. A person is deemed to be under the custody of the law either when he has been arrested or has surrendered himself to the jurisdiction of the court. The accused who is confined in a hospital may be deemed to be in the custody of the law if he clearly communicates his submission to the court while he is confined in a hospital. Pederanga v. Court of Appeals Q. Pass was awakened by a commotion coming from a condo unit next to hers. Alarmed, she called up the nearby police station. PO1 Ramos and PO2 Romulus proceeded to the condo unit identified by Pass. PO1 Ramos knocked at the door, and when a man opened the door, PO1 Ramos and his companions introduced themselves as police officers. The man readily introduced himself as Oasis Chung and gestured to them to come in. Inside, the police officers saw a young lady with her nose bleeding and face swollen. Asked by P.O. to Romulus what happened, the lady responded that she was beaten up by Oasis Chung. The police officers arrested Oasis Chung and brought him and the young lady back to the police station. P.O. 1 Ramos checked the young lady's statement who identified herself as A.A. She narrated that she is a 16-year-old high school student, that previous to the incident, she had sexual intercourse with Oasis Chung at least five times on different occasions and she was paid 5000 each time, and it was the first time that Oasis Chung physically hurt her. PO2 Romulus detained Oasis Chung at the station's jail. After the inquest proceeding, the public prosecutor filed an information for violation of RA 9262, the Vowsi Law, for physical violence and five separate informations for violation of RA 7610, the Child Abuse Law. Oasis Jones' lawyer filed a motion to the, be admitted to bail, but the court issued an order the approval of his bail bond shall be made only after his arraignment. Did the court properly impose the bail condition? No. The court did not properly impose that bail condition. The revised rules of criminal procedure do not require the arraignment of the accused as prerequisite to the conduct of hearings in the bail petition. A person is allowed to file a petition for bail as soon as he is deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender. An accused need not wait for his arraignment before filing the bail petition. Serapio v. Sandigan Bayan, January 2, 2003. Moreover, the condition that the approval of bail bonds shall be made only after arraignment would place the accused in a position where he has to choose between 1. Filing a motion to quash the information and thus delay his release on bail because until his motion to quash can be resolved, his arraignment cannot be held, and two, foregoing the filing of a motion to quash the information so that he can be arraigned at once and thereafter be released on bail. Labidas v. Court of Appeals, January, February 1, 2000. B. After his release from detention on bail, can Oasis Jong still question the validity of his arrest 2015? Yes. Oasis Jung can still question the validity of his arrest even after his release from detention on bail. Under Section 26, Rule 114 of the Rules of Court, an application for or admission to bail shall not bar the accused from challenging the validity of his arrest 
or the legality of the warrant issued therefor, or from assailing the regularity or questioning the absence of a preliminary investigation of a charge against him, provided that he raises them before entering his plea. Rights of the Accused Q. Under Republic Act 8353, one may be charged with and found guilty of qualified rape if he knew or before the commission of the crime that he is afflicted with human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, or acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, or any other sexually transmissible disease, and the virus of or disease is transmitted to the victim. Under Section 17, Letter A of Republic Act 8504, the court may compel the accused to submit himself to a blood test, where blood samples would be extracted from his veins to determine whether he has HIV. 2005-2010 Are the rights of the accused to be presumed innocent of the crime charged to privacy and against self-incrimination violated by such compulsory testing? No, the court may compel the accused to submit himself to a blood test to determine whether he has HIV under Section 17, Letter A of RA 8054. His rights to be presumed innocent of the crime charge to privacy and against self-incrimination are not violated by such compulsory testing. In an action in which the physical condition of a party is in controversy, the court may order the accused to submit to a physical examination. Section 1, Rule 28. Look for citation of latest cases in 2004. B. If the result of such test shows that he is HIV positive and the prosecution offers such result in evidence to prove the qualifying circumstance under the information for qualified right, should the court reject such result on the ground that it is the fruit of a poisonous tree? Since the rights of the accused are not violated because the compulsory testing is authorized by the law, the result of the testing can be considered to be the fruit of a poison tree and can be offered in evidence to prove the qualifying circumstance under the Information for Qualified Rape under RA 8353. The fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine refers to the rule of evidence that excludes any evidence which may have been derived or acquired from a tainted or polluted source. Such evidence is inadmissible for having emanated from spurious origins. The doctrine, however, does not apply to the results obtained pursuant to Section 1, Rule 28, 1997, Rules of Civil Procedure, as it does not contemplate a search within the meaning of the law, People v. Montilla. Q. X was arrested for the alleged murder of a six-year-old lad. He was read his Miranda rights immediately upon being apprehended. In the course of his detention, X was subjected to three hours of non-stop interrogation. He remained quiet until in the third hour he answered yes to the question of whether he prayed for forgiveness for shooting down the boy. The trial court, interpreting X answer as an admission of guilt, convicted him. On appeal, X counsel faulted the trial court in its interpretation of his client's answer, arguing that X invoked his me run the rights when he remained quiet for the first two hours of questioning, rule on the assignment of error, 2002 and 2010. The assignment of error invoked by X counsel is impressed with merit since there has been no express waiver of X run the rights. In order to have a valid waiver of the Miranda rights, the same must be in writing and made in the presence of his counsel. The uncounseled extrajudicial confession of X being without a valid waiver of his Miranda rights is inadmissible as well as any information derived therefrom. Q. Pedro, the principal witness in a criminal case, testified and completed his testimony on direct examination in 2015. Due to several postponements by the accused grounded on his recurring illness, which were all granted by the judge, the cross-examination of Pedro was finally set on October 15, 2016. Before the said date, Pedro died. The accused moved to expunge 
Pedro's testimony on the ground that it violates his right of confrontation and the right to cross-examine the witness. The prosecution opposed the motion and asked Pedro's testimony on direct examination be admitted as evidence. Is the motion meritorious 2016? The motion is meritorious. The cross-examination of a witness is an absolute right, not a mere privilege, of the party against whom he is called. With regard to the accused, it is a right guaranteed by the fundamental law as part of due process. Article 3, Section 14, Number 2 of the 1987 Constitution specifically mandates that the accused shall enjoy the right to meet the witnesses face to face. In Rule 115, Section 1, Letter F of the 2000 Rules of Criminal Procedure enjoins that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall be entitled to confront and cross-examine the witnesses against him at the trial. Accordingly, the testimony of a witness given on direct examination should be stricken off the record where there was not adequate opportunity for cross-examination People v. Fernando Monge Rosario In People v. Manchetti, August 6, 1980, the Supreme Court also held that if a party is deprived of the opportunity of cross-examination without fault on its part, as in the case of the illness and death of a witness after direct examination, he is entitled to have the direct testimony stricken from the records. Since the accused was deprived of his opportunity to cross-examine the witness without fault on its part, the motion to expunge is meritorious. Alternative answer. The motion is not meritorious. The right of a party to confront and cross-examine opposing witnesses in a judicial litigation is a personal one which may be waived expressly or impliedly by conduct amounting to a renunciation of the right of cross-examination. Where a party has had the opportunity to cross-examine a witness but failed to avail himself of it, he necessarily forfeits the right to cross-examine, and the testimony given on direct examination of the witness will be received or allowed to remain in the record. The conduct of a party, which may be construed as an implied waiver of the right to cross-examine, may take various forms. The common basic principle underlying the application of the rule on implied waiver is that the party was given the opportunity to confront and cross-examine an opposing witness but failed to take advantage of it for reasons attributable to himself alone. People v. Abatayao, July 7, 2004 Under the doctrine of incomplete testimony, the direct testimony of a witness who dies before conclusion of the cross-examination can be stricken only and so far as not covered by the cross-examination, Curtis v. West, and that a referee has no power to strike the examination of a witness on its failure to appear for cross-examination where a good excuse is given, People v. Honorable Alberto Cineris. At any rate, the accused may be deemed to have waived his right to confront and cross-examine the witness, when he asked the postponements of the hearing for several times. Therefore, the direct testimony of a witness who dies before the conclusion of the cross-examination should not be expunged from the records. Arraignment and Plea Q. D was charged with theft on an article worth 15000 Upon being arraigned, he pleaded not guilty to the offense charge. Thereafter, before trial commenced, he asked the court to allow him to change his plea of not guilty to a plea of guilty but only to a staffa involving 5,000 pesos. Can the court allow D to change his plea? 2002. No, because a plea of guilty to a lesser offense may be allowed if the lesser offense is necessarily included in the offense charge. Section 2, Rule 116. A staffa involving 5,000 pesos is not necessarily included in theft of an article worth 15,000. Motion to Quash Q. A criminal information is filed in court charging Anselmo with homicide. Anselmo files a motion to quash the information on the ground that no preliminary investigation was conducted. Will the motion be granted? Why or why not? 2009. No. The motion to quash will not be granted. The lack of preliminary investigation is not a ground 
for a motion to quash. Preliminary investigation is only a statutory right and can be waived. The accused should instead file a motion for right investigation within five days after he learned of the filing in court of the case against him. Section 6, Rule 112, as amended. Q. Pedrito and Tomas, Mayor and Treasurer, respectively of the Municipality of San Miguel, Leyte, are charged before the Sandigan Bayan for violation of Section 3, Letter E, Republic Act 3019, Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. The information alleges, among others, that the two conspired in the purchase of several units of computer through personal canvas instead of a public bidding, causing undue injury to the municipality. Before arraignment, the accused moved for reinvestigation of the charge, which the court granted. After reinvestigation, the Office of the Special Prosecutor filed an amended information duly signed and approved by the Special Prosecutor, alleging that the same intellectual facts, but with an additional allegations that the accused gave unwarranted benefits to SB Enterprises owned by Samuel. Samuel was also indicted under the amended information. Before Samuel was arraigned, he moved to quash the amended information on the ground that the officer who filed the same had no authority to do so. Resolved the motion to quash with reasons. 2009. The motion to quash filed by Samuel should be granted. Under RA 6770, also known as the Ombudsman Act of 1989, the Special Prosecutor has the power and authority under the supervision and control of the Ombudsman to conduct preliminary investigation and prosecute criminal cases before the Sandigan Bayan and perform such other duties assigned to him by the Ombudsman. Kalingan v. Disierto Absent a clear delegation of authority from the Ombudsman to the Special Prosecutor to file the information, the latter would have no authority to file the same. The special prosecutor cannot be considered as an alter ego of the ombudsman, as the doctrine of qualified political agency does not apply to the office of the ombudsman. Perez v. Sandy Cambayan, September 26, 2006. Q. B.C. is charged with illegal possession of firearms under an information signed by a provincial prosecutor. After arraignment, but before pre-trial, B.C. found out that the provincial prosecutor had no authority to sign their information as it was the city prosecutor who has such authority. During the pre-trial, BC moves that the case against him be dismissed on the ground that the information is defective because the officer signing it lacked the authority to do so. The provincial prosecutor opposes the motion on the ground of estoppel of BC did not move to quash the information before arraignment. If you are counsel for BC, what is your argument to refute the opposition of the provincial prosecutor, 2000? I would argue that since the provincial prosecutor had no authority to file the information, the court did not acquire jurisdiction over the person of the accused and over the subject matter of the offense charge, Kudia v. Court of Appeals. Hence, this ground is not waived if not raised in a motion to quash and could not be raised at the pre-trial. Section 9, Rule 117. Q. Rodolfo is charged with possession of unlicensed firearms in an information filed in the RTC. It was alleged therein that Rodolfo was in possession of two unlicensed firearms, a 45 caliber and a .32 caliber under Republic Act 8294. Possession of an unlicensed 45 caliber gun is punishable by prison mayor in its minimum period and a fine of 30,000 pesos, while possession of an unlicensed 32 caliber gun is punishable by prison correctional in its maximum period and a fine of not less than 15,000. As counsel of the accused, you intended to file a motion to quash the information. What ground or grounds should you invoke? 2005. The ground for the motion to quash is that more than one offense is charged in the information. Section 3, letter F, Rule 117. Likewise, the RTC has no jurisdiction over the second offense of possession of an unlicensed 32 caliber gun, punishable by prison correctional in its maximum period and a fine of not less than 15,000. 
It is the MTC that has exclusive jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction over all offenses punishable by imprisonment not exceeding six years. Section 2, RA 7691. Amending BP, Bilang 129. Q. Give two grounds to question information, 1998 bar. Two grounds to question information are that the facts charged do not constitute an offense, and two, that the court trying the case has no jurisdiction over the offense charged or the person of the accused. Note, the other grounds are, three, that the officer who filed the information had no authority to do so. Number four, that it does not conform substantially to the prescribed form. Five, that more than one offense is charged except in those cases in which existing laws prescribe a single punishment for various offenses. Six, that the criminal action or liability has been extinguished. Seven, that it contains averments, which if true, would constitute a legal excuse or justification. And eight, that the accused has been previously convicted or in jeopardy of being convicted or acquitted of the offense charge. Section 3, Rule 117. Q. If the information is not accompanied by a certification that a preliminary investigation has been conducted, is the information void? 1998. No. The certification, which is provided in Section 4, Rule 112, Rules of Criminal Procedure, is not an indispensable part of the information. People v. Lapura, March 15, 1996. Q. The information against Roger Alindokan for the crime of acts of lasciviousness under Article 336 of the Revised Penal Code avers that on or about 10.30 o'clock in the evening of February 1, 2010, at Barangay Matalaba, Imos, Cavite, and within the jurisdiction of this Honorable Court, the above-named accused with lewd and unchaste design, true force and intimidation, did then and there willfully, unlawfully, and feloniously commit sexual abuse on his daughter, Rose Domingo, a minor of 11 years old, either by raping her or committing acts of lasciviousness on her against her will and consent to her damage and prejudice, acts contrary to law. The accused wants to have the case dismissed because he believes that the charge is confusing and the information is defective. What ground or grounds can be raised in moving for the quashal of the information, 2016. The accused may move to quash the information based on any of the following grounds. A. That the facts charged do not constitute an offense. B. That it does not conform substantially to the prescribed form. And C. That more than one offense is charged except when a single punishment for various offenses is prescribed by law. Section 3. Rule 117, Rules of Criminal Procedure. In People v. De La Cruz, June 21, 2002, the Supreme Court ruled that the phrase by either raping her or committing acts of lasciviousness does not constitute an offense, since it does not cite which among the numerous sections of subsections of RA 7610 has been violated by accused appellant. Moreover, it does not state the acts and omissions constituting the offense or any special or aggravating circumstances attending the same as required under the rules of criminal procedure. These are conclusions of law and not facts. Thus, the information violated accused constitutional right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against him and therefore should be quashed on the ground that the information charge acts do not constitute an offense. Double jeopardy. Q. SPO1 CNC filed with the MTC in Quezon City METC QC a sworn written statement duly subscribed by him charging RGR, an actual resident of Cebu City, with the offense of slight physical injuries alleged inflicted on SPS, an actual resident of Quezon City. The judge of the branch to which the case was raffled, thereupon issued an order declaring that the case shall be governed by the rule and summary procedure in criminal cases. Soon thereafter, the judge ordered the dismissal of the case for the reason that it was not commenced 
by information, as required by said rule, some time later, based on the same facts giving rise to the slight physical injuries case, the CD prosecutor filed with the same EMETCQC an information for attempted homicide against the same RGR. In due time, before arraignment, RGR moved to quash the information on the ground of double jeopardy, and after due hearing, the judge granted his motion. Was the dismissal of the complaint for slight physical injuries proper? Yes. The dismissal of the complaint for slight physical injuries is proper because in metropolitan Manila and in chartered cities, the case has to be commenced only by information. Section 11, Revised Rule and Summary Procedure B. Was the grant of motion to quash the attempted homicide information correct? 2004. No. The grant of the motion to quash the attempted homicide information on the ground of double jeopardy was not correct because there was no valid prosecution for slight physical injuries. Q. D was charged with slight physical injuries in the MTC. He pleaded not guilty and went to trial. After the prosecution had presented its evidence, the trial court set the continuation of the hearing on another date. On the date scheduled for hearing, the prosecutor failed to appear, whereupon the court, on motion of D, dismissed the case. A few minutes later, the prosecutor arrived and opposed the dismissal of the case. The court rec reconsidered its order and directed D to present his evidence. Before the next date of trial came, however, D moved that the last order be set aside on the ground that the reinstatement of the case had placed him twice in jeopardy. Ascending to this motion, the court again dismissed the case. The prosecutor then filed an information in the RTC charging D with direct assault based on the same facts alleged in the information for slight physical injuries, but with the added allegations that D inflicted the injuries out of resentment for what the complainant had done in the performance of his duties as chairman of the Board of Election Inspectors. D moved to quash the second information on the ground that its filing had placed him in double jeopardy. How should this motion to quash be resolved? 2002. This motion to quash should be granted on the ground of double jeopardy because the first offense charge is necessarily included in the second offense charge. Draculan v. Tunado, December 19, 1985. Q. For the multiple stab wounds sustained by the victim, Noel was charged with preceded homicide in the RTC. Upon arraignment, he entered a plea of guilty to said crime. Neither the court nor the prosecution was aware that the victim had died two days earlier on account of his stab wounds. Because of his guilty plea, Noel was convicted of frustrated homicide and met the corresponding penalty. When the prosecution learned of the victim's death, it filed within 15 days therefrom a motion to amend the information to upgrade the charge from frustrated homicide to consummated homicide. Noel opposed the motion, claiming that the admission of the amended information would place him in double jeopardy, resolved the motion with reason. The amended information to consummate homicide from frustrated homicide does not place the accused in double jeopardy, as provided in the second paragraph of Section 7, Rule 117, 2000, Rules of Criminal Procedure. The conviction of the accused shall not be a bar to another prosecution for an offense which necessarily includes the offense charge in the former complaint or information when a. the graver offense developed due to supervening facts arising from the same act or omission constituting the former charge, or b. the facts constituting the graver charge became known or were discovered only after a plea was entered in the former complaint or information. Here. When the plea to frustrated homicide was made, neither the court nor the prosecution was aware that the victim had died two days earlier on account of his stab wounds. Q. McJolly is a troublemaker of sorts, always getting into brushes with the law. In one incident, he drove his Humvee recklessly, hitting a pedicab, which sent its driver and passengers in different directions. The pedicab driver died while two of the passengers suffered a slight physical injuries. 
Two informations were then filed against McJolly, one for reckless imprudence resulting in homicide and damage to property, and two for reckless imprudence resulting in slight physical injuries. The latter case was scheduled for arraignment earlier, on which occasion McJolly immediately pleaded guilty. He was meted out the penalty of public censure. A month later, the case for reckless imprudence resulting in homicide was also set for arraignment. Instead of pleading, McJolly interposed the defense of double jeopardy, resolved 2040. McJolly correctly interposed the defense of double jeopardy. Reckless imprudence under Article 365 is a quasi-offense by itself and not merely a means to commit other crimes, such that conviction or acquittal of such quasi-offense already bars subsequent prosecution for the same. Quasi-offense regardless of its various resulting acts. Ivler v. Honorable Modesto San Pedro November 17, 2010 Provisional Dismissal Q. In a prosecution for robbery against D, the prosecutor moved for the respondent of the first scheduled hearing on the ground that he had lost his records of the case. The court granted the motion, but when the new date of trial arrived, the prosecutor, alleging that he could not locate his witnesses, moved for the dismissal of the case. If this counsel does not object, may the court grant the motion of the prosecutor? Why? 2002. No, because the case cannot be provisionally dismissed except upon the express consent of the accused and with notice to the offended party. Single Larson Rule Q. Pass was awakened by a commotion coming from a condo unit next to hers. Alarmed, she called up the nearby police station. PO1 Ramos and PO2 Romulus proceeded to the condo unit identified by Pass. PO1 Ramos knocked at the door and when a man opened the door, PO1 Ramos and his companions introduced themselves as police officers. The man readily identified himself as Oasis Jung and gestured to them to come in. Inside, the police officers saw a young lady with her nose bleeding and face swollen. Asked by P.O. to Remulus what happened, the lady responded that she was beaten up by Oasis Jung. The police officers arrested Oasis Jung and brought him and the young lady back to the police station. P.O. 1 Remus took the young lady's statement who identified herself as AA. She narrated that she is a 16-year-old high school student that previous to the incident, she had sexual intercourse with Oasis Chung at least five times on different occasions and she was paid 5,000 pesos each time and it was the first time that Oasis Chung physically hurt her. PO2 Romulus detained Oasis Chung at the station's jail. After the inquest proceeding, the public prosecutor filed an information for violation of RA 9262, the Vauxi Law, for physical violence and five separate informations for violation of RA 7610, the Child Abuse Law. Oasis Jung's lawyer filed a motion to be admitted to bail, but the court issued an order that approval of his bail bond shall be made only after his arraignment. Before arraignment, Oasis Jung's lawyer moved to quash the other for separate information for violation of the child abuse law invoking the single Larson rule. Should the motion to quash be granted 2015? No, the court should not grant the motion to quash because the single Larson rule does not find application for the charges involved violations of RA 9262 and RA 7610, considering that each criminal act is based on a different criminal impulse and intent. In Santiago v. Corchi Terona, December 2, 1993, the Supreme Court explained that the single larceny doctrine applies only to criminal crimes committed delicto continuado, which exists if there should be plurality of acts performed during a period of time, unity of penal provision violated, and unity of criminal intent or purpose which means that two or more violations of the same penal provisions are united in one and same instant for resolution leading to the perpetration of the same criminal purpose 
or A. The said rule applies in theft cases, where the taking of several things, whether belonging to the same or different owners at the same time and place constitutes but one larceny. Pre-trial. Q. Lilio filed a complaint in the MTC of Lazuna for the recovery of a sum of money against one. The latter filed his answer to the complaint serving a copy thereof on Lilio. After the filing of the answer of one whose duty is it to have the case set for pre-trial, 2001. After the filing of the answer of one, the plaintiff has the duty to promptly move ex parte that the case be set for pre-trial. Section 1, Rule 18. The reason is that it is the plaintiff who knows when the last pleading has been filed, and it is the plaintiff who has the duty to prosecute. Pre-trial agreement. Q. Mayor T.M. was charged of malversation through falsification of official documents, assisted by attorney O.P. as counsel the party during pre-trial. He signed together with Ombudsman Prosecutor T.G. a joint stipulation of facts and documents, which was presented to the Sandigan Bayan. Before the court could issue a pre-trial order, but after some delay caused by attorney O.P., he was substituted by attorney Q.R., as defense counsel. Attorney Kikor forthwith filed a motion to withdraw the joint stipulation, alleging that it is prejudicial to the accused because it contains inter alia the statement that the defense admitted all the documentary evidence of the prosecution, thus leaving the accused little or no room to defend himself and violating his right against self-incrimination. Should the court grant or deny Kikor's motion, 2004. The court should deny Cure's motion. If in the pre-trial agreement signed by the accused and his counsel, the accused admits the documentary evidence of the prosecution, it does not violate his right against self-incrimination. His lawyer cannot file a motion to redraw. A pre-trial order is not needed. Bias versus Sandika Bayan. The admission of such documentary evidence is allowed by the rule. Section 2, Rule 118 Trial Q. Enumerate the requisites of a trial in absentia and a promulgation of judgment in absentia, 1997-1998-2010. The requisite of violent trial in absentia are 1. Accused arraignment 2. His due notification of the trial and 3. His unjustifiable failure to appear during trial. Bemarda v. People, April 4, 2007. The requisites for a valid promulgation of judgment in absentia are a. A valid notice of promulgation of judgment. b. Said notice was duly furnished to the accused personally or true counsel. c. Accused failed to appear on the scheduled date of promulgation of judgment despite due notice. d. Such judgment be recorded in the criminal docket and e. Copy of said judgment had been duly served upon the accused or his counsel. q. If an accused who was sentenced to death escapes, is there still a legal necessity for the Supreme Court to review the decision of conviction? 1998. Yes, there is still a legal necessity for the Supreme Court to review the decision of conviction, sentencing the accused to death, because he is entitled to an automatic review of the death sentence. Sections 3, letter E, and 10, Rule 122. People versus S. Paras. Remedy when accused is not brought to trial within the prescribed period. Q. At the public attorney's office stationed in Taguig, where you are assigned, your work requires you to act as public defender of the local regional trial court and to handle cases involving indigence. A. In one criminal action for qualified theft, where you are the defense attorney, you learn that the woman accused has been in detention for six months, yet she has not been to a courtroom nor seen a judge. What remedy would you undertake to address the situation and what form would you use to invoke this relief? Section 7, Rule 119 provides... If the public attorney assigned to defend the person charged with a crime knows that the latter is preventively detained, 
either because he is charged with a bailable crime, but has no means to post bail, or is charged with a non-bailable crime, or is serving a term of imprisonment in any penal institution, it shall be his duty to do the following. 1. Shall promptly undertake to obtain the presence of the prisoner for trial, or cause a notice to be served on the person having custody of the prisoner, requiring such person to so advise the prisoner of his right to demand trial. Number 2. Upon receipt of that notice, the custodian of the prisoner shall promptly advise the prisoner of the charge and of his right to demand trial. If at any time thereafter the prisoner informs his custodian that he demands such trial, the latter shall cause notice to that effect to send promptly to the public attorney. Moreover, Section 1, letter E, Rule 116 provides, when the accused is under preventive detention, his case shall be ruffled and its records transmitted to the judge to whom the case was ruffled within three days from the filing of the information or complaint. The accused shall be arraigned within ten days from the date of the ruffle. The pre-trial conference of his case shall be held within ten days after arraignment. On the other hand, if the accused is not under preventive detention, the arraignment shall be held within 30 days from the date the court acquires jurisdiction over the person of the accused. Section 1, letter G, Rule 116. Since the accused has not been brought for arraignment within the limit required in the aforementioned rule, the information may be dismissed upon motion of the accused invoking his right to speedy trial. Section 9, Rule 119, or to speedy disposition of cases. Section 16, Article 3, 1987 Constitution. B. In another case, also for qualified TAF, the detained young domestic helper has been brought to court five times in the last six months, but the prosecution has yet to commence the presentation of its evidence. You find that the reason for this is the continued absence of the employer complainant who is working overseas. What remedy is appropriate and before which form would you invoke this relief? 2013. I will file a motion to dismiss the information in the court where the case is pending on the ground of denial of the accused's right to speedy trial. Section 9, Rule 119, Tan v. People, April 21, 2009. This remedy can be invoked at any time before trial and, if granted, will result to an acquittal. Since the accused has been brought to court five times and in each instance it was postponed, it is clear that her right to a speedy trial has been violated. Moreover, I may request the court to issue supuena ducisticum and ad testificandum to the witness, so in case he disobeys same, he may be cited in contempt. I may also file a motion to order the witness employer complainant to post bail to secure his appearance in court. Section 14, Rule 119. I can also move for provisional dismissal of the case. Section 8, Rule 117. Demur to evidence. Q. After the prosecution had rested and made its formal offer of evidence with the court admitting all the prosecution evidence, the accused filed a demur to evidence with leave of court. The prosecution was allowed to comment thereon. Thereafter, the court granted the demur, finding that the accused could not have committed the offense charged. If the prosecution files a motion for reconsideration on the ground, that the court order granting the demur was not in accord with the law and jurisprudence, will the motion prosper? Explain. 2009. No, the motion will not prosper. With the granting of the demur, the case shall be dismissed, and the legal effect is the acquittal of the accused. A judgment of acquittal is immediately executory and no appeal can be made therefrom. Otherwise, the constitutional protection against double jeopardy would be violated. Q. Facing a charge of murder, X filed a petition for bail. The petition was opposed by the prosecution, but after hearing the court granted bail to X. On the first scheduled hearing, the merits, the prosecution manifested that it was not adducing additional evidence and that it was resting its case. 
X filed a demur to evidence without leave of court, but it was denied by the court. Did the court have the discretion to deny the demur to evidence under the circumstances mentioned above? Yes. The court had the discretion to deny the demur to evidence because although the evidence presented by the prosecution at the hearing for bail was not strong without any evidence for the defense, it could be sufficient for conviction. If the answer to the preceding question is in the affirmative, can X adduce evidence in his defense after the denial of his demur to evidence? No, because he filed the demur to the evidence without leave. Section 15, full 119. However, the trial court should inquire as to why the accused filed the demur without leave and whether his lawyer knew that the effect of filing it without leave is to waive the presentation of the evidence for the accused. People versus Flores. Without further proceeding, and on the sole basis of the evidence of the prosecution, can the court legally convict X for murder, 1998? Yes, without any evidence from the accused, the prima facie evidence of the prosecution has been converted to proof beyond reasonable doubt. Q. The information for illegal possession of firearm filed against the accused specifically alleged that he had no license or permit to possess the caliber forty-five pistol mentioned therein. In his evidence in chief, the prosecution established the fact that the subject firearm was lawfully seized by the police from the possession of the accused, that is, while the pistol was tucked at his waist in plain view, without the accused being able to present any license or permit to possess the firearm. The prosecution of such evidence rested its case, and within a period of five days therefrom, the accused filed a demur to evidence, in some contending that the prosecution evidence has not established the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt, and so prayed that he be acquitted of the offense charge. The trial court denied the demur to evidence and deemed the accused as having waived his right to present evidence and submitted the case for judgment on the basis of the prosecution evidence. In due time, the court rendered judgment finding the accused guilty of the offense charged beyond reasonable doubt and accordingly imposing on him the penalty prescribed therefore. Is the judgment of the trial court valid and proper? 2001, 2004. Yes, the judgment of the trial court is valid. The accused did not ask for leave to file the demur to evidence. He is deemed to have waived his right to present evidence. Section 23, Rule 119, People v. Flores. However, the judgment is not proper or is erroneous because there was no showing from the proper office that the accused has a permit to own or possess the firearm which is fatal to the conviction of the accused, Malari v. Court of Appeals. Q. A.A., a 12-year-old a girl, while walking alone, met B.B., a teenage boy, who befriended her. Later, B.B. brought A.A. to a nearby shanty, where he raped her. The information for rape filed against B.B. states, On or about October 30, 2015, in the city of SP and within the jurisdiction of this honorable court, the accused, a 15 minor, with lewd design by means of force, violence, and intimidation, did then and there, willfully, unlawfully, and feloniously, had sexual intercourse with AA, a minor, 12 years old, against the latter's will and consent. At the trial, the prosecutor called to the witness stand AA as his first witness and manifested that he be allowed to ask leading questions in conducting his direct examination pursuant to the rule on the examination of a child witness. Bibi's counsel objected on the ground that the prosecutor has not conducted a competency examination on the witness, a requirement before the rule cited can be applied in the case. After the prosecution had rested its case, BB counsel filed with leave a demur to evidence, seeking the dismissal of the case on the ground that the prosecutor failed to present any evidence on BB's minority as alleged in the information. Should the court grant the demur 2015? No, the court should not grant the demur 
While it was alleged in the information that BB was a minor at the time of the commission of the offense, the failure of the prosecutor to present evidence to prove his minority is not a basis for the granting of the demur, because minority of the accused is not an element of the crime of rape. Be that as it may, the court should not consider minority in rendering the decision. After all, the failure of the prosecutor to prove the minority of AA may only affect the impossible penalty but may not absolve him from criminal liability.